So uh, I think let's get started. First of all, thank you so much for making it. It's the last talk of a very, very long week. So thank you everyone for making it. And I've had, I, I, I hope you've had a nice, fun, productive, successful KubeCon. If not anything else, I hope you've made a new friend. So uh, my name is Madhav. Hi, I work at VMware. Um, I am a technical lead of SIG Contributor Experience. I'm a GitHub admin for the Kubernetes project. And I've worked on the Kubernetes storage layer on some really, really fun parts of it. Uh, so because of that, I've had to shed many a tear trying to understand what was going on. So hopefully I can peel that onion of abstraction for you without the tears. So let's get started. Before we start, uh, just a public call to help. We need help migrating proud jobs to community clusters. So if you're a person interested in infra infrastructure and want to get involved in the Kubernetes community, check that link out. Uh, so before we get into like the core of it, let's get a few prerequisites out of the way. So we'll take a 50,000 super, super high level view of what the Kubernetes machine looks like and how it works. We have something called the API server, which clients such as kubectl interact with. And Kubernetes being something called a declarative system, we declare what we want our intended state to be. So in this case, we want a deployment which has three pods, and we specify that as something called replicas. So if I do kubectl apply with this deployment, what happens behind the scenes? Uh, API server takes this deployment, persists it into etcd, and also now we have a bunch of controllers that run in the cluster. So these controllers are binaries, or the TLDR of this is that they're binaries that look for changes that happen in the cluster state. They need to know where we are currently, they need to know where we need to be, and then based on these two things, they sort of calculate a set of actions to take in order to get to where we need to be. So we have, uh, I've met, there are a lot of controllers in the Kubernetes cluster by default, but I've specified three of them here. We have the scheduler, we have the deployment controller, and we have the replica set controller. So the deployment controller sees that, okay, also we have a bunch of nodes in the cluster, each node has a kubelet, which also is a controller. And each of them talk to API server. No one talks to HCD directly, everything goes through the API server. So deployment controller sees that there's a deployment it's like, okay, cool, but the deployment doesn't have a replica set, so it creates a replica set. Great. Replica set controller wakes up and sees that, oh, there's a new deployment, uh, there's a new replica set we have, and then it sees that it has no pods in it because our pods are supposed to be three, so it creates three pods for us. Great. And then the scheduler wakes up and sees that we have three pods, but then none of them are scheduled onto any of the nodes, so it uses its own algorithm to figure out what nodes to schedule these pods on and schedule supports onto these nodes. So scheduler's job is done. Finally, kubelets on the nodes wake up and see that, oh, there are pods on my node that are scheduled that I don't have yet running. So it takes these pods, makes it a part of its local desired state, and reconciles its state on the node locally. So the kubelet sees that, okay, I have pod zero and pod one, and the other kubelet sees I have pod two, but none, none of them are running. So it starts these pods, and now you have three pods of your deployment managed by a replica set all via this controller magic, right? Now, the whole point over here and how we got to where, how we got to these three pods running is, we have these bunch of controllers that are running. And the fundamental concept here is that the controllers need to know what the current state of the system is, because if they don't know the current state, there is no way they can get to the desired state. Second, the controllers need to know what the desired state of the system is, because we need a North Star to go to and as soon as it knows both of these things, it can calculate a set of corrective actions to move from the, cur from the current state to the desired state. But how does it get to know what the desired state is, or how does it get to know what the current state is, rather? So to understand that, let's uh, take this sentence, right? Kubernetes is a declarative event-driven system. Kubernetes is declarative, what does that mean? It means that we specify intent. We don't specify how we want something to be done, we specify what needs to be done. And the way it works is, as I said, we have the current state, we have the desired state, and the controller takes actions on the current state to drive it to the desired state. So we need to start somewhere, and in order to take actions, we need to know what the current state looks like. So right now, we know what the desired state is because we are the ones who applied kubectl, and the controller knows what the deployment file was, but we don't know what the current state of the cluster is. 
So to do, so to get to know what the current state is, we perform what are called list operations against the cluster. So the, here, for example, this is saying, give me all the pods in the cluster that are in the default namespace, and you get a response object like this, which is a collection called pod list, and uh, items is the key which holds all of the pods in the default namespace. Um, re also, responses can get pretty huge. You might not want all of the pods in the default. So for example, if you have 100,000 pods in, across your clusters for some reason, uh, and you want all of them and you list all of them, that response can get pretty huge. So Kubernetes also supports paginating these lists. So you can, so you can say, give me the first 100 pods, and then once that happens, Kubernetes returns the first 100 pods and also gives you a continuation token with it. So what the continuation token does is you can give it back to the API server on, an, on the next list request, and it gives you the next set of 100 pods and the next set of 100 pods till you get all of the pods in your cluster. So event-driven system, what does that mean, right? Now, we know what the current state is because of our list operation. But now we need to know what changes occur in the system in order to react to these changes and take corrective actions. One alternative is we can keep listing all the time, which is super inefficient. But what Kubernetes gives us is this sort of event-driven mechanism where you, you get events such as, such as add events, modify events, up, delete events, and so on. So if I see that uh, deployment is added, my action is, is, does it have a replica set? If no, create one. And the replica set controller sees that, okay, I have an add event for a replica set. Does it have pods? No, create them, and so on and so forth. So uh, Kubernetes in itself, you won't find things like message buses and all of that inside Kubernetes, but as a mental model, it's helpful thinking of it as an event-driven architecture, and that's a great blog post if you want to check it out. So I have my state of the world through list. I now need to know when events happen that modify the state so I can take corrective action for them. And you might be seeing this term resource version in all of these response objects. Resource versions essentially tell, give you recency information about your cluster or the data that you're getting back. So over here, resource version is 1452. It means that the response that I got back was at a version 1452, and we'll talk about what a version means. And this basically tells you how recent your data is. So now that I know I have data as recent as 1452, I can tell Kubernetes that give me all changes in the cluster for all pods starting from 1452. I don't care what's happened before because I already know till 1452. So give me everything post that. So as and when these uh, events happen, I get a stream of notifications on a single connection that I can react to. So this is the watch mechanism of Kubernetes. So together, list and watch help enable this controller pattern and sort of is the key to understanding the Kubernetes architecture as a whole. So before we move forward, we, meant, we talked a little bit about resource version, but we weren't very specific about that. So let's dive a little bit into what that means. Um, so resource versions are opaque strings representing an internal version of an object. When I say an internal version, we basically surface the multi-version concurrency control that etcd uses internally to keep a history of changes for each object, and we surface that back to users via a resource version. And essentially, in Kubernetes, resource versions are one big global logical clock. You can order all the events in your system globally, and you can, do, you can, you can linearize all the events in your system globally uh, through a resource version. Resource versions are backed by etcd store versions, which by design provide a global ordering. And they increase monotonically anytime any change in the cluster occurs. It doesn't really matter if you change a pod or a replica set or a service. If any change happens, the resource version is going to change monotonically increasing. So uh, most importantly, they enable something called optimistic concurrency control. So uh, what that means is if I have two controllers running and one of them writes state, the other one won't be able to write state if it doesn't already know that this state is written. So it will try to by being optimistic that I know what's the latest state, but it might not be able to. So resource versions enable that as well. Um, if you want more insights into how resource versions sort of map onto etcd storage versions, uh, there was a great talk by a friend and colleague, Priyanka Sagu, uh, on Tuesday. So you should check that out. So coming to the, coming to the storage layer, right? Let, let's look at what the storage layer looked like in the past so that we can better understand how it is right now. 
so we have the API server and we have etcd. A client comes up, opens up a watch request against pods. Great, API server opens up a watch request against etcd. Another client comes up, opens up a watch request against pods. API server is like, okay, you know what? Cool, I know how to open up a watch request. So it opens up a watch request against etcd. And another client comes up, it opens up a watch request. Great. This is fine. I mean, Kubernetes doesn't really run scalable applications, right? It, it's meant to run my personal blog, right? Which no one visits ever. But that's not the case. More people might open up watch requests for pods and other resources. And the API server is going to open a separate watch connection to etcd every single time. And this isn't scalable. Not just is it opening up a separate watch request every single time, etcd has to send all of this data, package it in a way, compress it if compressions are enabled, uh, marshal it, all of that, send it back to API server. API server takes this data, unmarshals it, performs conversion, prepares a response, sends it back. So it's a whole lot of work that happens both at the etcd side of things and the API si server side of things. So like both are loaded in this case. What this means is if you have more replicas of your controller for high availability, higher availability after a certain point is going to result in lesser scalability for you because you're opening up that many more duplicate resource uh, connections to etcd. So how does the Kubernetes storage layer look like in the present? And these are diagrams I'm very, very proud of because they look so pretty and they're all pink. So let's take a look at that. Um, as with any computer science problem, we solve this problem with a layer of indirection. So we have our API server and we have all these clients opening up watch requests, but let's zoom in a little bit here. So we have the API server, but inside the API server, we have something called the cacher. And all of these things in the brackets that I mentioned there, these are actual Kubernetes type names. So in case you want to deep dive into the code later on for whatever reason, you can follow along with these slides along as a resource uh, to look at the code because I, find, I found that to be a little challenging and hopefully this helps you. So you have the cacher and then you have the store. You have something called the store. And a store is nothing but an index. Uh, it, it's, it's a Golang map, but it has some indexing support built on top of it. But the idea here is that the store is meant to be a reflection of the state in etcd. That's the whole idea. Also, you have a watch cache, something called a watch cache. So this is a FIFO buffer of finite size that exists uh, along with the store. Now, the watch cache is populated asynchronously from etcd because the cacher opens up a watch connection. So whenever you have all these add events, modify events, delete events, that happen in etcd, all of that get propagated back into the watch cache, and the watch cache populates all of that back into the store via callbacks. Now, you have the client which opens up pods. Great, we have a connection open. Now, that watch request can be served either from the watch cache or from the store. As we will soon see, I will tell you what each of these things mean. Another client comes up, opens up a watch request, it's served from the store, for example. Another client comes up, it's served, it's served from the watch cache, for example. But the interesting part is that each of these clients have come up, opened up watch requests. We haven't opened up a new watch connection to etcd. We've only kept the single watch connection that's helping us serve all these requests. Now, that's for pods. But what about for resource, uh, for replica sets, for services, for all of those other object types? You have one cacher per object type per group resource in Kubernetes terminology. And all of these are created at startup time. All of these are created when API server is initialized. So you have all of these clients coming in, opening up watch requests. Great, we have a cacher for all of them. If you have multiple of those, the same cache is gonna serve the request. So the store component is meant to reflect the state of etcd, as I said. Uh, cacher per object type is created at the API server startup time. and the caching layer can be disabled altogether if you don't want it. Because sometimes you have really, really tight memory constraints and a caching layer might just add on to that. So if you choose to disable the cacher, you are essentially saying that, you know what, I need extreme data consistency that I'm always gonna to go to etcd for, and I don't mind the extra latency that I get with that. And we'll talk about what that means soon. But you have an option of disabling caching altogether. But if you want to keep caching for some object types but not for the other, you can do that as well. We have flags in the API server that can do that for you. You can disable caching on a per object type basis. Now, now we've seen what the three layers sort of, of storage look like. 
but to understand how they impact scalability for your requests and how you can interact with them in a better manner while understanding the trade-offs, it's important to look at how different requests interact with the present storage layer. Before we do that, we need to look at this thing called resource versions again. We need to look at how they're interpreted by Kubernetes. Because this is, I'm not gonna lie, it gets hairy. But the reason for that is because we don't wanna break our users. Kubernetes did things a certain way a while ago, but then in order to make sure that we scale while maintaining compatibility, we had to make some not so neat trade-offs in terms of how resource versions are interpreted and uh, analyzed. So I'm gonna give you a brief overview of that. It's still not the whole picture, but I'm gonna to link to where you can read more about that. Uh, so in each, type, in each type of CRUD request, that is, you can pass a resource version parameter. That is, you can say that, hey, give me, uh, all, uh, give me all the pods starting at this resource version, or you can say, give me all the replica sets at this resource version, or you can even say, I don't care about consistency at all, just give me whatever you know. That is also an option because that's max, that's least latency, but also arbitrarily stale data. So all of these are also possibilities. So knowing how behavior changes with resource version, inter resource version interpretation can be crucial to scalability. So for get requests like get, get list, so get list is just a list request and watch. Watch is also a get request with just a get request parameter attached to it. So if resource version is just an empty string, that is if it's not set, it's interpreted as give me the most recent data. What that means is most of these requests that have an empty resource version are gonna to go to etcd by default because etcd is the source of truth. It has to have the most recent data. Uh, so this is what that is interpreted as. If the resource version is a string zero, then it means that any data is fine. Arbitrarily stale data is also fine. And finally, you have some specific resource version n. That means data at n. And this is also, this has two interpretations that I will tell you now. Uh, before I do that, most recent data is ensured by doing a quorum read in etcd. So whenever you do a more, whenever the read request goes to etcd, via this empty resource version. etcd does a round of raft. It makes sure that you get the most consistent read and all reads in etcd by default are linearized. There is an option for serializable reads and transactions, but all reads in etcd, that is at least all reads that Kubernetes issues to etcd are linearized by default. So that's what the empty resource version means. Now, I said that resource version equal to n is interpreted in two different ways. Um, it's via this parameter called resource version match. You have to specify this parameter if you specify your resource version n in your requests. So you have two of those, which is not older than and exact. Not older than basically tells you, give me data that is at least as new as n, and exact tells you, give me exactly n. I want the resource version n. So you either get n or you get a response saying that n has been compacted or a resource version too old or 410, I think, the error code is in Kubernetes. So as I said, this still isn't the full picture. Please see that link for more information. Okay, so now let's look at how each request behaves with Kubernetes. Um, first, you have the create request. Create requests go straight to etcd. They go straight to etcd, an object is created in etcd, all that, is, all that happens, great. But as I said, WatchCache is watching etcd right now. So as soon as an object is created in etcd, that change is propagated back to watch cache, which propagates it back to the store. So now we have a consistent state of etcd from off the created object back in the watch cache again. So as when you do reads, it's now available in the watch cache. Delete is the same way. You send the request directly to etcd, but there is an extra step here if you wanna read the code. We try to delete the version of the object that is present in etcd. Because as I said, you can have multiple versions of objects depending on how things are updated because etcd implements multi-version concurrency control. So we try to delete the version of the object that the API server knows about, but if it's not able to, it just deletes the object in etcd. And as usual, that change is propagated back to watch cache via the watch that's open against etcd. Now, update our operations, right? Uh, same thing, you try to update the version of the object that's there in the watch cache. If not, you just update the object and then propagate back all the changes via the watch. Now, get request. This is where things start to get interesting. And this is where uh, I'm gonna probably start rambling a little bit. Uh, just a heads up. 
if that happens, uh, we will talk offline. <laughs> but yeah, if resource version is empty string, as I said, this means give me the most recent data, give me the most consistent data. So the read goes to etcd, etcd does, etcd does a quorum read, a round of raft happens, and so on and so forth. Now, if it's zero, it means that any arbitrarily stale data is fine. So it goes to the watch cache and it just re it just does a lookup on the map and we're like, okay, this is the data, cool. I don't care how old it is, just give it to me. So that what ha that's what happens. But if you specify resource version N, the watch cache actually waits for the data that's in etcd to be propagated back for a little while. It waits for a little while. So as soon as it's propagated back, it returns that. But the request does not go to etcd. All of this happens asynchronously. So it waits for approximately three seconds till this happens. If it doesn't, if the, if the request is not, if the data is not propagated back in three seconds, it's going to return an error code. And this error code, if you're using default Kubernetes clients, is interpreted to be a retry. And as soon as that retry happens, that request is going to go to, going to, go to HCD directly. So you, you don't need to intervene at all. It's just that you tried to get, a re, you tried to do a low, low latency read from the cache. It didn't work out. Cool. You're going to go to, you're going to go to HCD, which is guaranteed to have your answer for you. Um, so once that happens, the read happens on the watch cache and so on and so forth. Now, get list. This is where I was talking about things get a little rambly. This is the function that decides if the request goes, goes to etcd or not. And we're going to walk through this function line by line and break it down and try to understand how you can maximize scalability here. So first check is consistent read from storage. That is, if resource version is empty, by default means go to etcd because we want the most recent data. Straightforward enough. Second, has continuation. So remember, initially I told you Kubernetes supports paginating REST requests. So you can say, give me the first 100 pods. It gives you the first 100 pods, but along with that, it gives you a continuation token. And in the next list request, you can provide that continuation token and gives you the next 100 pods, and so on, and so on, and so on. But if you specify a continuation token in your list request, that is always going to go to etcd. The reason for this is that watch cache does not support pagination. It cannot serve paginated list requests just yet. I actually did some work on the watch cache to paginate it, and this sort of worked pretty well, uh, but it adds a lot of complexity, so I don't know what's going to happen with this. But the work was pretty interesting, so we, instead of implementing the watch cache as a, as a map, or the store as a map, rather, we implemented it using B trees, and we did like copy on write semantics, and it was a whole bunch of cool stuff. So if you want to talk about that later, we can, we can geek out. Um, has limit, right? Like when I was doing my dry runs, this is the part where I was like, okay, I was like that crazy CNCF landscape meme explaining it. Uh, but I'm going to break this down. I'm going to try and break this down. Um, so we're going to look at the first part of the condition, right? Uh, pred dot limit. So if I specify a limit, it means that I'm going to specify a continuation later. And watch cache does not support continuations and it does not support pagination, so we're going to send that request to etcd. That's the first aspect of it. But if no limit is set, we can serve the list from the watch cache itself, because that doesn't, that means that we're not going to support, we're not going to uh, specify a continuation, and watch cache is capable of just serving a list request by itself. However, if we set a limit and put a resource version um, that is equal to zero, that's, we are just going to disregard limit altogether, and we're going to say, I don't care what you said to me, I'm going to serve the list request from the watch cache no matter what. So that's what it says. So when I specify resource version zero, I'm disregarding the limit entirely, and that condition is going to evaluate to false. Uh, well, so trying to understand why that's the case, so the first thing is resource version zero is any data semantics. I don't care about consistency, so serving it from the watch cache makes sense. But why do we do this? Why do we disregard limit altogether? Um, more importantly, it allows us to support requests which we know are going to be extremely large in size. And these are requests that are so large in size that etcd will face significant load if loaded from that. So what I mean by that is in a moderately large, uh, in, okay, in a large cluster, we can have nodes in the order of thousands, and each node can have pods in the order of hundreds. 
Now, if, a, if, if the Kubelet or the stateful set controller were to list all these pods, it's a huge amount of load on etcd. So what we do is whenever the initial, the first list request is issued, we ensure that we put the resource version as zero so that always, always watch cache is the one that serves it. It does not go to etcd so that we don't overload etcd. We serve it from the watch cache with arbitrarily stale data because we just want an initial idea of what these resource versions are going to be like. And we just want an initial idea of what the current state is going to be like. Later on, as and when we get more and more events, we can incrementally build up to the actual current state. Uh, so, and again, you have the unsupported match option. Watch cache only supports not older than. So if you specify exact semantics, because we want exact data, watch cache can't guarantee that because at the end of the day, it's a caching layer. So we end up sending the request to etcd again. So the only time we serve a list request from the watch cache is if we specify a non-empty resource version, it is not a paginated list, and we specify not older than semantics. So if you don't have strong consistency guarantees that, are, that you require, always it's always beneficial for you to specify a resource version and do um, a non-paginated list if you're okay with that and you, your cluster can tolerate it because you're going to get really, really good performance benefits from that. Great. So there's a few gotchas to keep in mind here, right? Because we did so much complexity, everything is done, we are good to go, but no. This also has some problems and that's why I'm here to talk about it. Uh, when you need consistent lists and the request goes to etcd, API server can also see spikes in memory. Because we saw that we, we force a resource version zero, we disregard limit, all of those scalability hacks we've done, but we still see spikes in memory. And that is because when we get data from etcd, it's unmarshaled under a lock. It take, conversions happen, we prepare a response under a lock, not anymore, some parts of it are not prepared under a lock, and I have another talk about that. Uh, I can send you the links to that. But yeah, you, you do a lot of work at the API server, most of, most of it under a lock, just to serve the data back. And this is because you're, you're requesting all of this huge amounts of data from etcd. And sometimes paginating responses also will not help if each chunk of the response is huge in itself. If I have 100,000 pods and I ask for five, uh, if, if I ask for like, let's say 1,000, uh, that's okay. But it's going to take me a lot of time. So if I ask for bigger and bigger chunks, I have bigger and bigger memory footprints and so on and so forth. So uh, there is a cap right now in the Kubernetes community uh, called watch list. Uh, so this proposes serving list requests, but using watch semantics. So you can stream list data back. You, so this gives you predictable memory footprints, and it handles the lack of pagination in the watch cache. Because now you can serve all the list requests, even if it's, even if it's just a small chunk, but from a, in a streaming manner. So uh, this is in alpha right now, as of 1.28. So if this is something of interest to you, please try it out, provide feedback to the community. It's set to go to beta in 1.29, which is set to release end of November. So uh, get list is another time, another gotcha is time traveling. So you, need, you have something called stale reads from the watch cache. And this usually happens in an HA setup. So you have two Kubernetes API servers uh, that have watch cache and cachers enabled each of which can have arbitrarily stale data. So whenever you do the first initial list, which is now forced with a zero resource version, which means give me any data, you can get data that you've already seen in the past because one of those API servers might be arbitrarily behind. And as soon as you see that data, you start reacting to the data and taking wrong actions. So you're vulnerable to something called stale reads in, in controllers. And this happens in HA API server setups. Um, externally, to, externally to Kubernetes, there are a few tools that have come out from collaboration between industry and academia. Two of such tools are Sieve and Acto, which can automatically detect such issues and more um, through automatic reliability testing of your controllers. And we, all, we have uh, researchers who do that in the room right now. So we have Tian Yin and we also have Trivikraman here. So if that, this is something of interest to you, please go talk to them after this. Now, within Kubernetes itself, uh, there are a couple of caps that are attempting to solve this problem. So the first one I talked about is watch list, right? So this, this is, um, we, are we, are, we are streaming data back into uh, the watch cache because 
we have a watch opens like open against etcd and we're using the same semantics to serve list requests so essentially you are serving data as and when it comes you're not waiting for a lock and serving arbitrarily stale data and then you have another cap called consistent reads from cache so this cap uh, argues that data in in the watch cache most times is recent enough we don't need to go to etcd all the time so this cap sort of tells you works on the fact that if i provide a specific resource version or if i don't provide a resource version at all it it basically waits for the cache to get populated back waits for the cache to be consistent enough what enough means is you can read the cap and then after that happens you can serve the you can serve watch requests uh, from the watch cache itself instead of going and list requests from the watch cache itself instead of going back to etcd this is also an alpha right now so if you're interested try it out provide feedback and uh, hopefully uh, we can move this to beta in the future kubernetes releases you also get some nice performance benefits from these caps so the watch list cap that i talked about uh, i don't think the numbers are visible but before this so this is cpu on the left is before so that's around averaging around 4 to 5 cores and on the on the left on the right it's after and that is after watch list is enabled this is memory footprint this is cpu footprint of the api server on the right it's averaging around 1.2 cores of cpu so you get some nice performance benefits and the same goes for memory as well and similarly for the consistent reads from the from the cache cap you also have some nice prelim, preliminary uh, performance improvements that you see not just for the api server but also for etcd now we're done with list finally we can talk about the watch request nothing too special here we've already talked about most of the things so if it's if it's an empty string we delegate the request to etcd as always otherwise we serve it from the watch cache but the way we do it is we create something called the cache watcher um, i'm naming these things so that when you go look at the code it's familiar to you so we create this thing called cache watcher which helps you serve these watch requests to each of the clients right and it also helps uh, deduplicate some of the objects that you need to serve back so it's it's a pretty nice abstraction but the way the cache watcher works is it allocates an input buffer statically at start time and the way it allocates is, is depending on what type of object is being watched and the sizes of these allocations are sort of determined through heuristics that we found out from our scale testing in the kubernetes community now as soon as the buffer becomes full we terminate the watch the client gets a 410 we restart uh, or we reestablish a watch and then things continue so on and so forth however the cost of keeping up with watch events the the cost of keeping up with watch events is essentially establishing a new connection because as soon as the buffer is full we stop it and we want to keep up so we establish a new watch and then keep on going but establishing a new watch all of those things also have a cost and this wouldn't be happening if for example if you have a lot of events but a static size allocated is very small because heuristics are heuristics at the end of the day they aren't fully accurate so however a slow client slow server or a storm of rapid updates is is enough to necessitate a new watch connection so there is also some very interesting discussion in the community happening of how we can dynamically allocate the size of this buffer and the issue has some really good analysis of how that can be done in the future he's also the person by the way who implemented the watch list feature so if you get a chance to talk to him you should okay we are done that was a lot uh, but in conclusion the list plus watch pattern is the central theme to how kubernetes the kubernetes machine works different requests interact differently with each layer of the storage layer of kubernetes depending on the resource version specified the resource version match specified and a combination of those two and specification of these parameters can help you make the trade off between data consistency latency and that can majorly impact scalability of your cluster now unless you have strict consistency guarantees rely on the watch cache trust it but also be mindful of the stale reads problem thank you for listening and coming for the last session of the day if you want to reach out or feel free to reach out